Welcome back to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast as we continue with this audiobook presentation of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. The authors are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. Publisher is Productivity Press 2022. My name is Alex and I'll be your host for the next couple of minutes as together we will enjoy chapter six. Chapter six of Stuck. How does culture get stuck? A couple of uh, couple of quotes here in the very beginning as all the chapters have had them. The first is by one Edgar Shin. Edgar Sheen. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of culture as a concept is that it points us to phenomena that are below the surface, that are powerful in their impact, but invisible and to a considerable degree unconscious. In that sense, culture is to a group what personality or character is to an individual. The next one is by Tony Sai. We believe that it's really important to come up with core values that you can commit to. And by commit, we mean that you are willing to hire and fire based on them. If you are willing to do that, then you're well on your way to building a company culture that is in line with the brand you want to build. I like that. Those are two good quotes. Right before the pandemic shut down, Patrick started working with a new client in the financial services space. He went into the office to learn more about the company and the new engagement. He was supporting a digital transformation, but anytime he goes into a new office, he finds himself investigating the culture. Patrick was given a point of contact prior to arriving that was the client's chief of staff. He gave the name to the front desk security guard in the lobby who led him to the elevator. When he got off the elevator onto the mostly glass floor of the 50th floor, Patrick was instantly struck by the view of Manhattan. He was met by a receptionist, this time employed by the company, who was sitting in a solid steel and glass desk who was sitting at He was met by a receptionist, this time employed by the company, who was sitting at a solid steel and glass desk surrounded by the view. The desk was empty aside from a phone and a keyboard. The receptionist was dressed casually in jeans and a t-shirt. He thought, shoot, I'm overdressed again. She took his coat and escorted him to a conference room. Along the way, Patrick noticed a few interesting displays. First, a timeline of the company's financial success from formation to present with some of the major milestones along the way. Second, another timeline demonstrating the company's contributions to a set of charitable or charitable organization. <clears throat> Don't slur that speech. Don't slur that shit, Alex. Second, another timeline demonstrating the company's contributions to a set of charitable organizations along with pictures of the team members actively volunteering for different groups. There were also some impressive pieces of art that were almost too large for the narrow hallways, but were still striking. And there is one more thing he noticed. All the senior executives had offices on the interior of the building. While many of the team members sat in open cubicles out in the sun-drenched open space. The conference room had an equally impressive view, and the receptionist offered him a cup of coffee. Patrick asked if he could get in. If he could, Patrick asked if he could get it himself. He never missed an opportunity to make his own coffee, as it helps him see where he will get the next cup. <laughs> the snack room was as nice as the conference room. A range of fresh fruits, dried fruits, nuts, teas, and coffee. A nitro cold brew coffee sparkling in still water. The provisions of a modern working coffee break. Patrick went back to the conference room to be greeted by the CEO and his CTO, who were both in jeans and casual shirts. 
he really did overdress. The CEO greeted Patrick by saying, so what do you think of our wall of fame? Patrick was confused. The CEO excitedly took him to a different hallway where there was an entire set of pictures that were grand works of art, but homemade drawings by children. The CEO said, each month, one of our offices volunteers with Ronald McDonald House, and the challenge is for the office to send in the best drawing from a kid along with the favorite as voted by the kids. As you can see, the kids have a sense of humor. Many of the pictures were labeled with names like Kenny, age 7, and Jessica, age 10. Then others said Thomas, age 25, Frank, age 32, Bob, age 62. Is this one yours? It's terrible, Patrick sheepishly said to the CEO. Isn't that great? He said with a boisterous laugh. As we walked, as we walked, as we walked, oh, okay, I, I get it, I get it, because this is coming from the, from the perception of, from the perspective of uh, Victoria. So Victoria, I guess, wrote this chapter, and Patrick is, is uh, mulling around getting coffee, Me meandering around getting coffee and admiring works of art. As we walked back to the conference room to discuss digital transformation, Patrick asked him his burning question, why the office? It doesn't seem to fit your culture. Again, the laugh, and the CEO said with a smile, sometimes in this business, your client wants a show, but you need to make sure your team really knows who we are. As the story above demonstrates, there is something unique about this financial institution. They all have the trappings of a fine New York financial house, but all the casual nature and humility of a local barbershop. That's what makes the organization unique, and it provides a differentiated position in the marketplace. For those who want exclusivity, you've got it with the security, the top floor, the view, and as we came to learn, well-dressed financiers. For those who want a company with a casual work-life balance, the company seemed to offer that too. But for their team members, this was one culture that was characterized by the phrase protecting wealth for families. That was their culture. We work for families, our clients, and our own. If you are trying to get something to stick or unstick, it will not happen without an understanding of culture. And yet, the formation of culture is an attachment process and creating organizational culture is about creating stickiness for your organization. Therefore, working through instead of against attachment will be the way to create, affect, and change culture. In this chapter, we will explore what is culture and how does it relate to getting stuck? How can we create a culture that sticks? What is the challenge when our culture gets stuck? How does culture overcome difficult situations? What is culture? In a 2017 survey of 1,348 of executives from across North American public and privately owned corporations, nearly 92% agreed that improvement in quote-unquote corporate culture would increase your firm's value. At the same time, 65% agreed culture was very important at their company, and more than half of the executives agreed that a culture that nah, and more than half of the executives agreed that culture was a quote top three part of their value proposition as a firm. With all of this emphasis on the value of culture in a firm, only 16% of the executives agreed that their culture is, quote, where it should be, meaning they need to work to optimize their culture. It's clear that culture has value. It makes one wonder how many executives really know the culture of their organization. It is not meant as an individual challenge to any one executive more a question of how hard it is to understand culture. Culture is difficult to define in any organization and even harder to manage. So what is culture? Culture is the way we do things here. In an organization, 
Sorry. In a group or organization, culture represents the guidebook, the rules of the road for that organization. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what will be lauded, what will be laughed at, what will be rewarded, and what will be punished. It is unique to the group. At whatever level you choose to explore, and often it is hard for any one person to describe it within the group. Often, it takes an outsider to identify the culture in an organization. That is, because organizational culture comes with a few complex paradoxes of culture that relate to the elements of attachment we have discussed in previous chapters. Point. Culture is both seen and unseen. Point. Culture develops social cohesion and supports market value. Point. Culture is both intentionally created and unintentionally co-created. Point. Culture often has an internal meaning and external meaning. And then point. Culture is both singular and siloed. As to seen slash unseen, organizational culture has two parts to it, the seen and the unseen. The visible side of culture is the symbols, the story, the mythology, the artifacts, the acronyms, the jargon, the offices, and even the people that we observe when we walk around an office or interact with an organization. In short, it is all the objects that are unique to that organization. The unseen side of culture is the deep set of shared assumptions, beliefs, and values that bring these objects to the organization. The American organizational psychologist Edgar Sheehan calls culture an iceberg, explaining that we see a small part of the culture when we look around, but it is beneath the surface where we will find why these objects represent the culture. As we discussed in Chapter 5, Objects can often serve as attachment representations for other concepts. In the case of culture, this can have a double meaning. The physical object can be the source of the individual's attachment and, at the same time, the object may also be a representation of the deeper belief system of the organization. As one set of researchers called it, organizational symbolism or, quote, those aspects of an organization that its members use to reveal or make comprehensible the unconscious feelings, images, and values that are inherent in that organization, end quote. For example, in our opening story, the casual attire of the office might be highly valued by the team members because it represents a difference between the company and their competitors. And as William G. Dyer, the organizational culture, and change researcher notes, quote, it is the perspectives, values, and assumptions that are central because they embody the interpretation of the artifacts, thus representing the belief system behind the artifacts. Social cohesion slash marketplace. The cultural elements of an organization play an integral role and creating market value and integrating people into the organization. Market value is created by the efficiency and effectiveness that is gained by having consistent, predictable, reliable products, solutions, and service to customers and clients. This can be attained without having social cohesion, but organizations that have a higher reliance on people will inherently have a higher reliance on a social base to deliver these results. Therefore, a strong cultural base is necessary for new members of the organization to learn the routines and procedures that yield maximum market value. For many organizations, this economic incentive and the ability to adapt with market conditions drive the desire for cultural cohesion. As individuals learn the rules of the road, they understand what it means to succeed and fail in the organization. These rules also establish norms around what is acceptable behavior in the organization and what is just and right. Collectively, these cultural norms set a common language for the organization to share beyond the quote standard operating procedures of the work. 
This creates a feeling of group membership and ultimately a more effective and committed workforce, which also makes the group more resilient to change. As we discussed in the chapter two, in the chapter two, that's what it says, as we discussed in the chapter two, stickiness resides in the intuitive brain where memory, emotion, and learning are co-located. It is important for new team members to feel the emotional side of the culture, in parentheses, like the objects and deeper values, while learning the organizational structures, guidelines, and procedures to make these more routine elements feel like more than just activities. The most effective way for this socialization to happen is through the process of social mimicry, through which a new team member internalizes the importance of not only the work, but the behaviors that represent the culture. There is a wonderful scene in the movie Office Space, where the character played by Jennifer Aniston, Joanna, is being asked to put on more pieces of flair as part of the culture of the restaurant Tchotchkes, where she works as a server. She doesn't want to. Her manager asks her to look at her coworker Brian, who has on 37 pieces of flair and says, so you want me to, and she says, so you want me to wear more? The manager must take a sidestep to explain the purpose of the flair and what it means to the culture. While we are not supposed to be on the manager's side, it is a good example of how social mimicry can work. If Joanna was more interested in the job, she might be more willing to follow Brian's lead. And where are those chatskis? Intentional slash co-created culture. Likewise, culture is in it, likewise, culture is produced in two different ways intentionally and unintentionally. Intentional culture is developed by organizational leadership creating the conditions of culture. Mission statements, strategy, objectives, values, and objects that support and align to this vision. In an effectively aligned organization, employees will see and feel that this alignment exists through intentional behavior from the top down. This might take the form of physical objects like organizational charts, systems, processes, routines, manuals, and performance programs. But the unintentional culture emerges in two different ways. One, the implementation of these physical objects, and two, the history or mythology behind these objects. There's a little gray box, a little gray box for exercise. Civil rights and music co-creating transitional space and a transitional object. The U.S. civil rights movement is far from over, it says. Social change that was sparked four centuries ago became a righteous flame in 1960s, four centuries? Became a righteous flame in 1960s America only to find its embers returned recently in the wake of more violence against black Americans. Uh. However, it is, it was in the protest, in the protest. However, it was in the mostly peaceful protest of 2020 that something became apparent as a missing element from the landscape compared to its historical predecessor. It was a missing element. Let's see how they justify this missing element. <laughs> The Freedom Song, it says. A song about freedom, huh? In the 1960s, protests were often coupled with a soundtrack of protest songs that came straight out of the hymnals of the local church. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, this, this past protest, Mostly Peaceful, was not at all church-like. Many members of the protest movements grew up hearing one of the tunes or verses in their local pews as a child. As the movement evolved, freshly minted songs emerged in the same spirit, but they came directly out of the gospel tradition. Songs like We Shall Overcome, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize, and Go Tell It on the Mountain were not only a way to create a common cause, but they also created protection and a mental escape. As Rutha May Harris noted, the songs were the same, only thing we had to change was a lyric. Jamila Jones was one of the founders of the Harambee Singers 
and an attendee of the famed Highlander Folk Center, where she participated in writing a verse of We Shall Overcome. Jones tells of one night while at the Highlander Folk Center when the police came in to break up the group in darkness. The police had billy clubs and guns while the young people sat in darkness with nothing. Someone began singing quietly the words, We are not afraid. Jones goes on to explain, and we got louder and louder with singing that verse until one of the policemen came and said to me, if you have to sing, and he was actually shaking, do you have to sing so loud? And I could not believe it. Here, these people had all the guns, the billy clubs, the power. We thought, pause, and he was asking me with a shake if I would not sing so loud. And it was that time that I really understood the power of our move, of our music, how powerful it was that this, it unnerved him so much that he had to come and ask that he had to come and ask that I not sing so loud. And I can just tell you that I got louder and louder. And somehow, even the nature out there in the darkness, because everywhere was dark, but it looked like our voices blended from the nights to the points of complete harmony and beauty. And from then on, I knew exactly how powerful our songs were. What happened with the freedom songs of the 1960s is that they were at once familiar enough to create an attachment, emotional enough to, emotional enough to move the singers into a transitional space and shared in a way that created a shared experience. That new memory connected with the motion and older memories was now a new attachment, and when it yielded power over guns, it could be used in times of strife. As Rutha May Harris explains, these songs were an attachment to a youthful experience that helped many protesters to at once unite and escape back to an emotionally safe place even when facing difficult times. Harris notes, without those songs, I don't believe there would have been a movement because it took away a lot of fear. Harris recalls the uncertainty of every protest. They may end in threats, prison, or violence. It may be from the other, if only from the other side. Hold on, hold on. They may end in threats, prison, or violence. And then in parentheses, it says, if only from the other side. Okay. I mean, all right. Because they're definitely trying to draw that parallel from the 1960s to 2020. I mean, okay. In an interview, she recalls a police officer with a drawn gun. We never knew what to expect. We didn't know whether we would get shot or whether we would get beat up. That's when the songs came into play. They kept me from being afraid. Music is linked to emotion. It can open a transitional space where both a common past memory can be shared and a new memory can be created simultaneously. This powerful emotional experience creates a different kind of experience that opens a transitional space, a new attachment, and over time, a unique culture from the civil rights movement. There are certainly protest songs today. They represent some powerful and emotional music, but they, were, but they are created for mass consumption of the message to change hearts, not mass unity to galvanize minds. Hmm. Hmm. There are certainly protest songs today, it says. They represent some powerful and emotional music, but they are created for mass consumption of the message to change hearts, not mass unity to galvanize minds. So they kind of like halfway drew a parallel and then said that 2020 is fucking it up. They said 2028, 1960s. They don't make protest songs like they used. They don't make them like they used to anymore, man. Fucking tell you that much. Okie dokie. First, the implementation process of culture is often where unintentional culture starts. Ironically, the unseen elements of culture have the greatest impact on how unintentional culture develops. It is not how the values are written by the leadership, but how they are lived by each member of the team and how they are reinforced by the leadership through even the most casual of settings. Think back to our opening story. The leadership 
took two casual intentional steps. Sorry. Ooh. Casual and took two casual intentional steps. Was it casual or causal? The leadership took two, it says here, casual intentional steps to try and encourage part of their desired culture. They put a visual of financial performance for the entire company. They shared success and terrible drawings of their team members by their team members from all over the country. Individual humility. If this behavior is followed by promotions of people who only look out for themselves, it will not work. The culture will break. But if the team around the country rewards the people who are demonstrating performance and teamwork, that will set a different tone. Second, there will be a cult second, there will be cultural elements co-created with the members of the organization. These are sometimes referred to as latent cultural elements. These are the dormant beliefs and assumptions that team members bring to the organization when they join and that mix with others in the organization along with the organizational goals that create new elements of organizational culture. While this may feel like losing control of the culture for more controlling organizations, it is a promising sign for an organization. As we discussed in chapter 5, when individuals are creating elements of shared memories with the organization, they are in a transitional space, which means they are willing to share not just a current state, but also a future state with an organization. In short, they are committed. Internal meaning slash external meaning. Culture tells a story within an organization and outside of the organization. For the financial firm at the start of our chapter, we, sorry, they, for the financial firm at the start of the chap, for the financial firm at the start of our chapter, they intentionally wanted to adjust that story based on the audience. Most organizations want to tell the same story, both internal and external to the organization. However, the issue above of organizational co of cultural fucking I'm, I'm tripping up on this paragraph however the issue above of cultural co-creation gets much harder as we move beyond the walls of our own organization mythology can be created and spread the objects come with emotions and start to represent more than just the shared assumptions and beliefs of the organization they represent the shared beliefs of others too. Or worse, there can be two different realities experienced around a culture. Look at figure 6.1. It is a law enforcement badge. It is one symbol that takes people in different directions. For the officer, it is a representation of the authority that has been granted to them as an officer of the law. For many civilians, it is a sign of safety in their community and stability. In the United States and around the world, some see the image and no longer feel the safety intended. What sits under each of these views is a deep set of assumptions and beliefs that leads them to each perspective about the culture represented by a single object. What does this object make you think? What would people say about the objects produced by your organization? Singular slash siloed culture. Within an organization, there is likely to be one dominant culture, which is a culture that expresses the core of the organization. But that may not be the only culture in the organization. There, are, there may be many subcultures or many cultures that exist across the departments, divisions, or geographical entities within the organization. Often, Regional offices create their own unique traditions or activities that yield some subtle differences in culture for that region. This can feel like co-creation, with a central culture losing control. But it might be the way that some people or localities are attaching to that culture. Subcultures are not inherently a problem. In fact, in larger organizations, they may be a necessity to sustain effective connection through the organization as it grows. 
They can be a way for people to create local or shared memories around the parent culture that allows the culture to sink into the mind for the individual or group. In this way, subcultures can be beneficial. The key is that these subcultures need to unify back to the overarching culture. The opportunity to make culture stick. Attachment principles underlie all these concepts of culture and effectively support individuals in an organization. The core mechanism at play is the supporting function that cultural elements and objects provide individuals as they transition into a new organization. Now the question becomes, how do we build the right culture to create stickiness in an organization? First, we know that new team members come to an organization with two feelings. One, motivation to succeed, and two, a desire to fit in. Second, we also know that individuals need to learn about the new organization they are joining. Last, we know individuals are coming to the organization with some need to create an attachment with a support uh, last, we know individuals are coming to the organization with some need to create an attachment with a support object that will help them through this transition. In short, new employees come to the organization in a transitional space ready to soak up culture. So, let's throw some objects at them and it should stick. Wrong. There is the individual attachment to attachment objects is not the same there uh, what this sentence is fucked hold on there the i'm going to say there the individual attachment to attachment objects is not the same as attachment to the culture yeah, there we go it's complex there are three factors at play factor one individual attachments to objects factor two collective agreements of cultural attribution to the of the objects cultural attribution of the objects. Factor three, individual agreement that the object is a representation of organizational culture. We know from chapter five that an individual forms attachments to all kinds of objects. Let's imagine a new employee named Catherine comes to your organization. She may form attachments to objects to create a sense of safety in the organization and due to her attachment style. We know that uncertainty creates stress for almost everyone. As people join new organizations, that schools, teams, volunteer opportunities, work, they seek the familiar face because familiarity creates a sense of comfort. Therefore, Catherine may form an attachment with Jane, who is just like her, out of simple comfort. Or it may be a result of her attachment style. Perhaps Catherine is a preoccupied person seeking someone as a support object in her new role. Either way, this connection is her choice. That's factor one. Factor two is the collective agreement that her choice in object is part of the culture of the organization. Sticking with our example above, if Catherine selects Jane as an attachment object, we need to know if Jane is a good example of the culture of the company. Catherine is likely to mimic Jane. If Jane... Sorry. If Jane is a perfect example of the culture of the company, then over time, this will become clear to Catherine. Other people will affirm Jane's alignment with the company's culture and talk about how Jane quote-unquote fits in. However, perhaps Jane is not a fit and should move on from the organization. This could lead to Catherine having an adverse reaction toward the company. This is where factor three comes in. Does Catherine think of Jane as part of the company culture herself? Does Catherine think Jane is an integral part of the company experience? Do the two of them have a connection that is independent of the company or is it solely dependent on their time at the company? Moreover, is it so valuable to Catherine that without Jane, the company loses some value for Catherine? If their friendship transcends work, then Catherine may need to find another attachment on the job, but she may be willing to stick with the company. In fact, 
she may be the one who fits in. Of course, the process is rarely as conscious as described above. It is often much less conscious. And mimicry is not the only way to make culture stick. As mentioned above, there is intentional work that organizations can do to nudge culture along. This is done through clearly defined incentive structures that measure culture beha cultural behaviors. This is done through clearly defined incentive structures that measure cultural behaviors at the same level of importance as outcome-based performance. There are limitations to this approach, as there are often unintended consequences of driving measurement of cultural elements, which can often be difficult to quantify and even more difficult to support with evidence. Some employees may resist overt attempts to make them align to a culture. However, studies have shown that by and large, employees who disagree with the culture do tend to a trait. A, tr a trit? A trit. That's like attrition. Leave. They tend to leave. The more challenging situation is when leaders believe they are driving some sort of the more challenging situation is when leaders believe they are driving one sort of culture and the employees, usually via middle management, are casually driving another version of the culture. This, this where, this is where, it's missing the is. This is where an unfortunate reality of our previous section sets in. Culture is an interdependent act between leaders and the led. Swedish management scholar Mats Alvesen says it best. There is a lot of interest and hope attached to the idea of organizational culture as a vital element to management control. It is related to the attraction of A, the possibility of moving the entire organization in a similar direction, and B, to do so through idealistic means, ideas, and values. This has led to great efforts in managing specific, often strongly visible and explicit forms of symbolism. However, there is only so much that can be accomplished. Culture cannot be engineered, but merely understood, respected, and enhanced with greater levels of trust between the leaders and the led. We know that when there is alignment between leaders, the led, and the situation, that there can be great culture. Take the story of Google. You must look past all the perks and incentives you may have heard about Google, about the Google culture to see it. You must look past all the perks and incentives you may have heard about the Google culture to see it. Laszlo Bach is the former vice president of people operations at Google. He describes Google's work environment in detail in his book, Work Rules. But what Bach says at the very outset is that he hopes people can learn from Google's culture without trying to replicate it. Outsiders often look at Google and see an amazing culture of stuff. They see it great facility design, great facility design. They see great facility design, collaborative workspaces, assets on campus like a dry cleaner, a bank, rental cars, free food, and innovative technology experiments that employees support. That's the tip of the uh, that that's the tip of the iceberg. That's what's visible. Let's hear about the invisible. But what it takes to understand that visible culture is the underlying philosophy and assumptions that align to create those spaces. The underlying assumption and governing philosophy are even more remarkable. And it is summed and it is summed up in one quote from Bach. Just a quick side note. Y'all ever uh, yawn? Not from, I don't know if I'm tired or exhausted or what, but I'm like low-key eager. I want to go do something. Well, it's Tuesday, so back at it. All it takes, this is from Bach, Bach's quote. All it takes is a belief that people are fundamentally good and enough courage to treat your people like owners instead of machines. Machines do their jobs. Owners do whatever is needed to make their companies and teams successful. 
Google has no problem providing assets to its employees because it does not think of them as employees, but as owners, as partners in building the organization. Each organization must find its own culture. What works for Google will not work for every company. That's an important lesson in building culture. The organization must look deep in its iceberg and not just copy the objects off somewhere else. And once the assumptions and beliefs that make up culture are understood, they must be developed, supported, and nurtured to help both people and organization. The Challenge When Culture Sticks In a heated scene from the AMC hit workplace drama Mad Men, the lead character and eternally struggling modernist Don Draper finds himself up against a young woman who is asking for something more from her work. Peggy, Don's sometimes muse and sometimes nemesis, wants a sense of appreciation for the hard work she has put into a singular effort. She wants a thank you. Don retorts simply, that's what the money is for. The benefits of attachment in the workplace is that it is that it is this is again this is a typo but you know it's their first edition fam it's their first edition folks don't don't go so hard on them i'll shit on them if i have to if it's like completely out of pocket but um if it's completely out of hand if it's completely coming off of the chain i can shit on them but uh and I am also trying to revise in real time. Maybe next time they could, I don't know, outsource revision and editing for the next edition. <laughs> the benefits of attachments in the workplace is that it helps build culture in a company by developing deep connections among individuals to help them feel a part of something bigger. Employees let go of objects they lean on from other parts of their life to lean on objects in the organization for support. The, these new attachments become the reason that they stick to the company. The Maslowian pyramid is certainly at play in this model. Of course, money comes first. People work to pay for their life, but... Beyond that, they find other reasons to work for one company over another company. As we have discussed throughout this chapter, culture is one of these reasons. So, what happens when you need to change the culture that made them stick? When we create sticky culture, there is always the risk it will break. It is like breaking any attachment. There will be a sense of loss. A culture change might be a slightly worse sense of loss because it might feel like breaking the entire psychological contract with the organization or psychological contract for the organization. Remember, there is only so much intentionality in the creation of culture. So a stated culture change is the organization stating that it will also be changing things created by the employees. Therefore, any organization needs to fully understand its own culture before it starts breaking any parts of an existing culture. Moreover, we need to assess and help adjust culture in a way that appreciates connection via attachment and culture. Victoria and Rachel Whitman have developed an exceptional model for assessing the attachment-based culture using four dimensions. Visibility the obvious presence of the culture for its members and how the behaviors unique to the culture will be recognized and potentially intimated, imitated, imitated, not intimated, imitated. There is connection, that's the trust and confidence of the members with an emphasis on interdependence to highlight relational attachments within the culture. There is unity, the prominence of a singular organizational culture to unite various subcultures and promote cultural harmony instead of cultural silos. There is commitment, dedication or commitment of the members to the organization, its mission slash vision, and its core values and beliefs to measure overall engagement. Each of these dimensions can be assessed with a series of questions to employees about the organization. This is a starting place 
for how to work with the culture that exists before moving to shift the organization. Leaders and change makers will be better armed to help move people through the process of culture change by understanding the current culture and attachments through these four dimensions. The outcome is a sense of the risk and an awareness of what attachments may be broken, what's trust may be strained, and perhaps where the culture can be strengthened along the journey to help more people stick. Now for some practice exercises in this gray box. We have to collect and analyze. We have to investigate your organizational culture. Your organization's culture is a case you need to solve. Any good detective will tell you that to solve a case you will need one, a timeline of events, and two, hard evidence. This exercise is designed to help you crack your organization's culture by building out the timeline of culture formation within your company, both intentional and unintentional, with the subject you know best, you. From here, you can decide whether these findings can be generalized to the rest of the organization. To do this, you will need to visualize times that you had interactions with your organization's culture. You may need to close your eyes to do this. Note, we do not recommend closing your eyes while reading this book. Each piece of evidence can be put into a little timeline with Table 6.1. In order to get started, think back to your interactions with your organization over time. There was interviewing, onboarding, the first day, town halls, regular communications, quarterly events, annual events, casual interactions. The natural settings of the office. What is emphasized in these interactions? What objects? What people? What visuals? What rewards? What concepts? What ideas? What does this evidence reveal about the culture of the organization? Is the organization more performance focused or more people focused? Is the organization more efficiency focused or effectiveness focused? Is the organization more focused on team members or customers? Is the organization more focused on internal needs or external stakeholders? Is the organization more focused on stability and control or flexibility? How does this evidence support the culture of the organization? Does it create visibility for the culture? Does it create connection across people and dependence with each other? Does it create unity across the enterprise or the subcultures? Does it yield commitment to the overall organization? When you are done, can you look at this list and pinpoint when you got stuck or unstuck to the organization? What about the culture caused you to feel your commitment or cost you your commitment or cost you the commitment? Now we apply testing culture change. The only way to understand whether culture can change in an organization is to conduct small tests of culture change. These small tests will teach you both the resiliency of the culture and the ability to conduct culture change. To do this effectively, you need to understand the deep underlying assumptions that support the visible elements of culture. Of culture. In short, you need to document the assumptions and beliefs before you can test them. Step 1. Document the assumptions, beliefs, and demonstrated behaviors. These are bullet points. Review the previous exercise, in particular the what does it reveal column. What are the, what are the common themes? Do any of these themes get to a set of deeper assumptions or beliefs from the organization? Do these assumptions or beliefs align with the stated beliefs of the organization? If so, how? If not, why not? Group the assumptions and beliefs into four or five overarching statements. If you have fewer, that's fine, but you should not have more. Take these four or five statements, document, how do you see these demonstrated daily? Where is a, vis where is a visible place that these are demonstrated? A demonstrated behavior does not need to be a big thing. One business leader said of their organization, everyone holds the door for each other. That's how we show we are in this together. Another example might be around the way that certain shared spaces or common areas are used or maintained. Now, step two, test the waters. Once you have clearly identified a demonstrated behavior that supports the culture of the organization, you will 
have to be bold and buck the trend. You may need to do the opposite or at least something different to see if the culture can be changed. Develop a small modification to the demonstrated behavior that is noticeable enough to test reactions. In the example above of holding the door, you may want you may not want to be that person, but there may be a positive version. You may you may not want to be that person, but there may be a positive version. Hmm. For example, when working with one organization, Patrick was continually irked at people was continually irked that people would leave the coffee area so dirty. It was cleaned nightly, but throughout the day it was a mess, as if people had no time to simply wipe up their spills. Despite all the language about values, the demonstrated behavior was we are too good to clean up after ourselves. He started cleaning it twice a day to see if others would join on what he started to clean in he started to clean it twice a day to see if others would join in the efforts. What is your version of this? Hmm. Creating positive culture change, I suppose. So this is table 6.1. I'm giving you a, an auditory description of it. It is a graph. It's a chart. It's a matrix of sorts. The, uh, it's called Culture Investigation Report. The top two rows. The top two rows are... Um, Sorry, the, the, the top row. The top row is, is uh, outlines, I guess, like subjects or schedule. The first one, the, the top left, the top left column being the date. Second column being the type of interaction. The third column being what was emphasized, question mark. The fourth column being what does it reveal, question mark. And then the fifth column being... The dimensions of culture, and then the dimensions of culture, that's even split into another, uh, that row itself, it's split into four more other, like smaller columns, like four sub-columns. And the four dimensions, again, are visibility, connection, unity, and commitment. And they actually give us an example. They fill in the first one for us. 10 slash 2015. I'm assuming that's October, October 2015. The type of interaction there in the second column they put there was an interview. And what was emphasized in that interview were the values. That's the third column. The third column of what was emphasized is the values. In the fourth column, what does it reveal is that the organization is people focused, focused on effectiveness, and focused on flexibility. And then in the dimensions of care, where those four dimensions are, the visibility, the connection, the unity, and the commitment, there are X's for visibility and unity. Why? Because, well, in the interview, they learned the company's values were focused around people, effectiveness, and flexibility. That means that there is, that there is a visibility and a unity component to it. I personally might say a connection component or a commitment, to, a commitment component any any of these actions done right, I think, would trigger all four dimensions. But uh, ultimately, that's that's in an ideal organization where where professional support systems are aces, and uh, unfortunately, not all organizations can tout having such uh, such rapport, such reputation. That concludes chapter. Six, or this is part seven of Stuck on uh, on our podcast, on the Corporate Cowboys podcast. Keep this operation non for profit. If you can help, please do so. You can subscribe to our Patreon. You can send us donations. There is a link floating around, uh, like a link tree. And it's got a Venmo, a PayPal, and a, a Cash App. And any funds that come this way are remitted to the nonprofit organization keeping this mission essentially free, free for you to listen, free for professional, free for you to participate in your own professional development, even if it's just listening to this audio book and my commentary to it. I get my commentary was a little light for this chapter. I felt it was somewhat straightforward. <clears throat> I didn't feel the need to rip on anything. Um, and that might be, maybe I'm having a good, Maybe I'm maybe I'm having a good day today. You know, uh, that might be it. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not sitting on hairpin triggers or anything like that at the moment. <clears throat> so um, yeah, that brings this chapter to a close. I'm gonna wish you a great 
rest of your week. Until next time.